So this week, I found a wonderful poem entitled Heaven by Rupert Brooke. It's a sort of poetic introduction to the world of fishing. Fish fly replete in depth of June, dawdling away their watery noon. Ponder deep wisdom, dark or clear, each secret fishy hope or fear. Fish, fish say they have their stream and pond, but is there anything beyond? This life cannot be all, they swear, for how unpleasant if it were. One may not doubt that somehow good shall come of water and of mud. And sure, the reverent eye must see a purpose in liquidity. We darkly know, by faith we cry, the future is not wholly dry. Mud unto mud, death eddies near. Not here the appointed end, not here, but somewhere beyond space and time is wetter water, slimier slime. And there, they trust, there swimmeth one who swam ere rivers were begun. Immense, a fishy form and mind, squamous, omnipotent and kind. And under that almighty fin, the littlest fish may enter in. Oh, never fly conceals a hook, fish say in the eternal brook. But more than mundane weeds are there, and mud celestially fair, fat caterpillars drift around, and paradisal grubs are found, unfading moths, immortal flies, and the worm that never dies. And in that heaven of all their wish, there shall be no more land Say fish. Well, the call of Simon, according to the Gospel of Luke, begins with a marvelous fish story. Maybe not the fish story of Rupert's poem, but a wonderful story that we have entitled The Miraculous Catch of Fish. And it unfolds into a life changing experience for Simon, which we'll be exploring together for the next six weeks. For as Henry David Thoreau once said, many men go fishing all of their lives without knowing that it is not fish they are after. Well, fishing was a common trade on the Sea of Galilee or Lake Gennesaret or the Lake of Galilee. It's known by a wide variety of names in the New Testament. And fishing was the most common occupation for people residing in the small communities of Capernaum and Bethsaida, which were located just right on the lake shore. And living on the shores of Lake Galilee with its abundant supply of fish, people understood fishing perhaps more than they understood farming. So living on the shores of a fishing lake, the whole town, you may say, was into fishing. Now, this event at the Lake of Galilee provides a wonderful framework for Jesus to ask and address two really important discipleship questions. What does acting in faith mean? And what is the fruit of an act of faith? So Luke shares with us the following. At this Lake of Galilee, Jesus teaches the people from a boat belonging to Simon. And after his discourse, he says to Simon, put out into the deep and let out your nets for a catch. And as Matt shared with the children, Simon answers, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Simon, we might think, who had years of experience with fishing, faced a dilemma, sort of a challenge. I mean, what does he do with this instruction from Jesus? A carpenter gave an experienced fisherman a command that is totally at odds with his professional experience. 
I mean, during the night, there's a much greater prospect of a big catch. And if one did not catch anything during the night, the chances of a good catch during the day were even smaller. Moreover, Simon was dead tired after a night of fruitless work. On the other hand, he really admired Jesus. I mean, he had heard his impressive sermon in Capernaum. He'd been witness to the miraculous healing of his mother-in-law. I mean, that's a pretty neat thing. And other sick and possessed people. So I can only imagine that at that moment, Simon was sort of conflicted on the inside. On the one hand, they, he understood all about fishing, and he had thoughts and experience as a fisherman. And on the other hand, he had this affection and admiration for Jesus and the things that he had seen Jesus do. So for him, the instructions of this impressive man from Nazareth, himself not a fisherman, were totally unexpected. Simon had esteem for him. He addressed him as master. So what does Simon do? Well, he capitulates. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And so he did. Simon actually did an act of faith, which seen from a hu purely human point of view, contradicted his professional experience as a fisherman. He went along with it and was obedient to the word of God, and he didn't react to the Lord's invitation with words such as if or but, and magnanimously he put aside every excuse that came to his mind on the basis of his own thinking, his own feeling, and his own experience. It was sort of a conquest of self which exceeded the natural limits of his person. And by following Jesus' instruction, we might say he acted supernaturally. And Simon proved at that very moment that he did not want to just remain an admirer of Jesus. He showed that he was also prepared to obey him with loving faith. He disregarded his own ego and refrained from doing only what he could understand. He made his own purely human truth subordinate to what he saw as God's will manifest through Jesus. So I would say that an act of faith consists in essence not of religious thoughts or feelings, but an act which exceeds and transcends human limitations and understanding. Now, religious feelings might accompany our life of faith, and religious thoughts and readings and contemplations may bring us closer to the world of faith. But to be able to get to know God step by step in all of God's majesty and glory, it's really necessary to act in faith. And so Simon says, but... At your word, I will let down the nets. And then Luke tells us how such acts of faith are richly rewarded. And when they had done this, he writes, they enclosed a great shoal of fish, and as their nets were breaking, they beckoned to their partners in the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. Are you seeing how big this really is? I mean, when the Lord does something, he doesn't do it halfway. Simon and the other fishermen could experience the joy and the astonishment which everyone has who is willing to step out and do acts of faith. All of their expectations had been exceeded. The nets started to break and the boats almost sank under the load. And as the best teacher and exceptional knower of the human heart, Jesus knew how to best deal with these fishermen from Galilee. This overflowing net made an impression on Simon, for he was astonished, we read, and all that were with him at the catch of fish which they had taken. So we see Jesus expressing his divine power in a new way, 
um, and an unexpected way to Simon. And despite the apparent senseless casting of the nets at the beginning of our story, Simon's act of faith is richly rewarded. Now, I don't know about you, but if that happened to me, I think that there'd probably be some sort of great expression of enthusiasm and admiration about what he sees as this miracle of Jesus. But instead, we read that Simon fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. So why at that moment a repentant acknowledging of guilt? Why does Simon sort of seem to reject Jesus with the words, depart from me? I mean, like, Jesus, get out of here because I can't handle what I'm seeing at the moment. Why instead of words of thanksgiving and gratitude or even excitement and joy, does he sort of have this submissive attitude of repentance? Well, I think that at that moment, something really wonderful happened in Simon's soul. Because he was obedient in faith, Simon not only received an abundantly filled net, but also a penetrating light which illumined his soul. And while he and his companions struggled to pull the overflowing nets to shore, his heart was filled at one and the same time with the greatness not only of the catch of fish, but the greatness of Jesus who became his beloved Lord. And also with a greater and keener knowledge of himself. You see, loving obedience is guaranteed to bring a better knowledge of God and at the same time, a deeper knowledge of who and whose we are. So Simon comes to a greater awareness that his knowledge and ability were nothing in comparison to the divine power of God. And so then Jesus knew that now the time had come in which he could say, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. Well, Jesus' answer had to come unexpectedly. I mean, we see that he accepts the humble confession of Simon, and then he doesn't give him much time to think long and hard about what's been going on, but he entrusts to him a new and unexplained task which brings him into an eternal plan of God. And without delay, without protesting anymore, I mean, we don't hear anymore that Simon says, oh, no, God, uh, no, Jesus, I can't do that. I'm not worthy. Remember, I just confessed about how unworthy I am. Instead, Simon and with him, James and John, accepts in faith this new task given to them by Jesus. For them we read, and when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. So Jesus tells his first disciples that they are to fish for people, to catch people for Jesus Christ. Now, experienced fishermen and fisherwomen make a distinction between fishing and catching. So evidently, some fishermen spend a whole lot of time fishing for fish, but not much time catching them. And in Jesus' metaphor about fishing, it seems that Jesus was suggesting that the disciples both fish and catch other people for Jesus Christ. And all four Gospels agree that the first fundamental tenet of discipleship, God uses disciples to catch people for Jesus Christ. And we find the same theme in the Gospel of John when the disciples ask their family and friends to come and see Jesus. So these two phrases, come and see Jesus and catch people for Jesus, they mean the same thing. We Christians are called to be fishermen and fisherwomen. We're called to be disciples who say to others, come and see Jesus. In our mission statement here at Desert Skies, we say we're to lead our neighbors to Christ. Now, 
You can't lead others to Christ unless you've been caught by Christ yourself. And it's really hard to hear your call unless you have come and seen Jesus for yourself. So have you ever had the sense that Jesus was calling you to something that was more than usual or more than logical? And maybe, just maybe, were you open like Simon to say, well, because you say so, Lord, I'm willing to try? Could you accept today in faith a new task that you feel God may be giving you? Might you be ready to go fishing? You see, every single one of us needs to speak to others out of our personal experience of having been caught by Jesus Christ, of having come and seen the goodness and greatness of the love of God in Jesus. And friends, that looks amazingly different for every single one of us sitting here today. And we, the church, I think, often make some foolish mistakes. We, we talk about fishing, but we never get around to fishing. Or we ask people to come and see the programs and possibilities of our congregations rather than inviting people to come and see and know the presence and power and person of Jesus Christ Friends, Jesus has come into the world to reveal God and to redeem the cosmos. But he's known to us only through the witness of those who have experienced him. And the call of the first disciples marks the beginning, the beginning of a movement that culminates in the founding of the church. The church did not come into existence through a group of persons who wanted to start a good, even benevolent organization. From the Gospels, we learn that it had its beginning with Jesus, who called certain persons to follow him. And he created a community of disciples who heard him preach and teach, who saw him heal, and finally suffer, die, and be raised again on that first Easter. And the whole story of the church is actually reflected in this story itself. When Jesus calls, Simon is at first hesitant. And he thinks that what Jesus asks of him is both unnecessary and too demanding. Nevertheless, Simon responds, and he discovers that life has a surprise in store for him. And by doing what Jesus asks him to do, he experiences God. And so it is for us. God often becomes manifest in the ordinary, even seemingly unnecessary events of a person's life. Events which are nevertheless in accord with some purpose that might be or might not be known to us. And throughout history, the church has continued to exist and carry on its ministry in spite of the tenuous responses of its members. So this ancient image of a church as a fisherman's boat tossed about on the sea but sustained by the presence of the living Lord is appropriate in every single age. The call of Simon is our call as well. Will we join Jesus at the lakeshore? Are we ready to go fishing? Amen.